You're listening to the Rethreading Madness podcast, which airs live on Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. We are recorded and produced on the unceded traditional territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Slayway Tooth Nations around Vancouver, B.C. I'm your host, Bernadine Fox, and this is the show that dares to change how we think about mental health. Welcome to our show. When I've never been You're listening to Rethreading Madness on Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. I'm Bernadine Fox, and today I have a bit of a combo show. We're going to start out talking to two people who have had long COVID and how it has impacted on both their physical and mental well-beings. But then Fraser McKenzie from Coast Mental Health will be joining us to talk about the services that they offer here in Vancouver, BC. So don't go away. We'll be right back. You're listening to Rethreading Madness. I'm Bernadine Fox, and I'm speaking with Jane Bowie. Jane, tell us a little bit about who you are. Yeah, hi, Bernadine. Um, I am currently the acting executive director at Parent Support Services Society of BC. It's a small uh, nonprofit that uh, believes that uh, the best way to support children is to help parents and those in parenting roles be the best parents they can be. So we work with all different kinds of parents as well as kinship caregivers. Um, uh, And prior to working at Parent Support Services, I was a Vancouver school trustee and I've spent all my life being an activist trying to make the world a better place. Yes. It is a good thing to do, and I'm glad you've been doing it for all this time. Um, our show today is about COVID, and and that statement we keep hearing from everybody about how COVID has impacted on our mental health. And I know that you got COVID, and I'm hoping that you can tell us a little bit about what happened when you got COVID. How did it affect you physically, and what happened to you emotionally? And was the emotional stuff the effect of the physical illness or was it something that was happening in your brain? Mm. Yeah, those are, those are good questions. So yeah, I came down with COVID tested positive in March of 2021. So that was before the, uh, the vaccinations were out. Um, I, I, my, my, my family, we all got sick, my partner and my son and, it wasn't a, I wasn't, I didn't have to be hospitalized or anything and was in sort of in many ways a relatively mild case. But I was one of those people where um, I got long COVID it, it, symptoms. I, I felt like I got better and then things just got worse and stayed worse uh, right up until around March this past year. So, I mean, this current year. So I was sick for two years with it. So you got sick in March of 2021? Yeah. And And started feeling better in March of 2023. So two years. Yeah. So the original illness came and went, and Mm -hmm. then you were left with what? Um, I I think a lot of people have heard some of the symptoms. I I had unbelievable fatigue. Um, Fatigue at a level where I had a hard time keeping my my head up it just seemed like an incredible amount of work for my neck Mm -hmm. um i would suffer from shortness of breath with very little movement um and and my heart would race um i if i was in a meeting i would look down at my watch that it's one of those fitbit watches and it would i would see that my heart rate was like 127 and it wouldn't fall and I was just sitting in a meeting mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um and so those are those are things that I think people are relatively familiar with and there was brain fog associated with it and memory loss um but it was all things that were very unusual for me um I had always been somebody who worked you know it wasn't unusual for me to work a 60 hour work week to between between my paid work and my volunteer work and my political activities i just that's just what i did and all of a sudden i was in this situation of of facing um this kind of situation where it seemed like 
very little very little activity would impact me so terribly but then i also had like unusual symptoms that that i didn't know about i had uh, there was the loss of smell and taste, which people were just starting to get to know, but that only lasted for a few months, which was hard, but it was only a few months. But then when they came back, they came back in a distorted form. So tastes were different than they had been before. Um, and I was just plagued for about a year and a half with, and actually just was experiencing it again this past week um getting phantom smells there's a complicated name for it but it um for me it took the form of an uh, an electrical smoke smell and it would wake me up in the night um it triggered my asthma even though there was no smoke like there was nothing i i would check with everybody around and i was constantly afraid that that our play, our apartment was burning down but there was nothing it was just it was just this um uh fake smoke and i also had ringing in the ears uh constantly for a long time and anybody that's had tinnitus knows how hard that is so mm -hmm. those things all combined um with another another symptom was i i lost my ability to regulate my emotions mm. which was i've always been somebody people that know me i'm a you know a pretty even keel kind of person i mean other than you know enjoying laughter i tend not to it takes a lot for me to get angry or upset i mostly you know, if, if something is disturbing me, I take time and reflect. Uh, all of a sudden, I would, at the drop of a hat, I was, I was incredibly emotional. And to the point where um, it was during the pandemic, so most people were working remotely, but um, my uh, executive director and I were in the office together. And I got so upset, I threw myself on the floor, screaming and, oh, and oh dear. Like, like, thank goodness, there was nobody else around. But it also like it helped, it helped shake me. And I realized to what extent um, I needed I needed something. I needed some sort of help. And 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 my my workplace was very supportive. My executive director was really supportive of 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 me. And 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 so I went and um, got some I went to my doctor um, who, when he heard my uh, description of my symptoms, luckily I was with a doctor who recognized, understood um and acknowledged the existence of long COVID and could see that's what it was. He referred me, it referred me to the post COVID recovery clinic um, at, at VGH. Mm -hmm. It took me six months to get into that, but that was incredibly helpful when I did. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But the other thing was, is that at the same time I was dealing with all of these things I had never, I just didn't feel remotely like myself. And I, I, I felt like I was going mad. And I, I, for the first time in my life had serious suicidal thoughts. Mm. Um, so I also, um, with this, you know, thank goodness I've got some benefits at work and I was able to um, make contact with a psychologist who, who had some experience with patients with long COVID um, and she was extraordinarily helpful with me. And then once I got into the long COVID clinic, they had all sorts of support groups and from mental health support drop-in groups to um, groups on that you could go and attend. This was all online, but groups on, um, on things like fatigue and the importance of pacing and brain fog and strategies to deal with that. And uh, those things all really helped a lot. Um, and I also had an incredibly supportive, accommodating workplace. I, 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 I continued to work all through this. My doctors, the doctors at the long COVID clinic, everybody told me I should be quitting. Um, or at least taking long-term disability because um, that was 
everybody said that was the only way I could get better. Mm -hmm. I, I, I couldn't afford to do that. And I, I, I know there were some people that had no choice. They were so sick. There's no way they could keep working. But for myself, I was in that in between level that um, as long as I worked and I paced myself, I rested and meditated um, every couple of hours at work. Um, and I cut everything else out of my life. Um, my social life, I cut that out. I cut out my uh, political activity, all my volunteer work. Um, all Basically, all I did was go to work, um, come home, say hi to my family and go to bed. Did that day after day for a couple of years with a few with a few exceptions, I, I, I was able to get together with friends one-on-one -on -one, um, once in a while, as long as I didn't overdo it and didn't mm -hmm. extend it more than half an hour, an hour. I, um, and we went on a couple of small family holidays where I took it easy and um, got to see some sights and that was nice, but mostly it was just work and sleep. So a question that I have, um, you're talking about the impact of COVID in a way that most of us don't know, like, like mm -hmm. the whole, we know about, you know, sore throats and headaches and coughing and, you know, chest congestion and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But I think the way that it's impacted on our brains has not been, in my opinion, in my sort of little world mm -hmm. has not really hit me so much. And as I'm listening to you, I'm wondering whether or not because I know that other people have talked about COVID and long COVID as being sort of um, like the, the, as having also encephalitis as a part of that. And so I'm wondering whether or not, you know, you talk, these things you're talking about, being able to smell things that aren't there mm -hmm. and your heart racing, even your body temperature, you know, being, I, we talked about that before, not being able to regulate yeah. that. All of those things are a part of how your brain functions. And I know yeah. this because I have chronic fatigue and mm -hmm. it's all about your nervous system and my heart will do the same thing. And mm -hmm. um, um, so I'm wondering whether or not there's a damage physically to our brain that's causing these things to happen yeah. or whether this is the emotional impact of um, having an illness. And I'm, uh, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I think. I mean, I think it's a combination. I mean, the 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 research is showing that there's that 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 um, COVID uh, has impact on on many organs in the body, including the brain. It's a vascular, it's a vascular um, illness. It, mm -hmm. um, so there is, you know, it, there is. A lot of research showing that there's there, there's damage in those areas. I, I, I got a ton of tests done, and um, like one thing that's interesting is like my heart was fine, even though it didn't feel like it was fine. But um, and some people's hearts have been damaged, but mine mine was okay. So it clearly was it was the connection between my brain and my heart, um, believing, like going into that flight mode um mm -hmm. and causing the heart to race rather than there being something um actually physically wrong with the heart the other thing too is like with my lungs they they told me my lungs weren't bad but then the last time i was at the, <laughs> the last time i got work done and they looked told me that the results on my lungs my lungs looked way better than they than they did last year and i thought well I thought my lungs were okay, so right. I guess it's all relative. <laughs> <laughs> but but I also, you know, I mean, I I know that the emotional side has a has an impact on it. I mean, I I think everybody that listens to your show knows there's a connection between between health and um, physical health, mental health, and emotions. It's all interconnected. So. Um, you know, the fact that I had trouble regulating my emotions and got so upset. I mean, the, the reason I got so upset at that, at that particular example that I'm giving was that I couldn't make um, my executive director understand the extent to which I needed to be able to lie down on a couch. Right. She thought I, she would, she laughed about it. 
um, and said to, that I had a fixation on a coach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. From somebody who has <laughs> chronic fatigue, I can assure you, and I can tell everybody that the moment you know you have to lie down, you don't have another second to consider it. It's yeah. like lie down right now. Wherever Exa you are, lie down. Exactly. Um, so so that I do know that 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 you know, in, in some ways, my response wasn't unreasonable. By I've lived my life probably being too controlled right. in terms of my emotions. So um, it, it was like a 180 degree shift, but I've out of this and doing the getting the counseling that I've taken and, you know, learning more about myself through this whole process. Mm -hmm. I think I'm much better able to both understand myself and to be able to express my needs to others. Cool. That's always yeah. a good thing. Yes. Yay. <laughs> um, I just want to go back a bit um, mm -hmm. because I know from chronic fatigue it is a problem with your central nervous system and how they explained, and there's this whole theory that COVID, long COVID and chronic fatigue are the same thing. And mm -hmm. we know that chronic fatigue, one of the things they surmise triggers it off is a virus of some kind. So mm -hmm. we have that as well. But we mm -hmm. also have the difficulty with your heart rate. Mine would go from 120 down to 40 and then back to 120 mm -hmm. sitting on a couch, like doing nothing. Yeah. Um, uh, your breathing can be weird. Your temperature can be weird. Your blood pressure, my blood pressure will go through the floor. People oh, yeah. try and tell me that I'm really healthy and I'll say, no, <laughs> I'm just half dead. Um, <laughs> So, um, so it's interesting because we know that from chronic fatigue, that that's not, um, it's not an emotional reaction. It is actually an autotomic nervous system yes. reaction that you literally can't control, other mm -hmm. than, you know, to find out what might impact on it a little bit different ways for you. Mm -hmm. So interesting. It's, it fascinates me. Yeah, um, it is um, fascinating. And that, that is, uh, you know, I, uh, I mentioned to you before when we were speaking before that the people that we talked to at the clinic, a lot of the resources we were given in terms of strategies to deal with it came from work that's been done with people with chronic fatigue. So, mm -hmm. um, and yes, that's, that's a lot, of, a lot of what you said is exactly what we were taught, okay. but, but um, I also, um, I know that meditation and doing yoga nidra, which is like a deep meditation, made a huge difference. That was one of the things that, and I'm not somebody that comes from that world. I'm, <laughs> it's, it's a <laughs> real either. shift. It's a shift for me to, right. to, to, um, be talking and doing these things, but, um, it, it, I, I, I really believe that doing that regularly, um, made a huge difference for me because mm -hmm. it slows, it slows everything down in your system. Right. Right. Would it be fair to say then that part of the long impact, you know, never mind the physical stuff and everything, but you know, anybody who has a disability, mm -hmm. um, what happens is your body betrays you and that it's no longer getting up and doing whatever it was that it used to get up and do. You're having to deal with things differently. It changes who you are as a person and how you're able to cope with your world. And, and that's a lot of what I'm hearing you say, please correct me if I'm wrong. No. Um, so all this physical stuff aside, you're also dealing with the fact that you're, You're not the person changed. was. You're yeah. not the person you were before COVID. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. and people remark to me about how my personality was changed. Really? Um in the last and then in the last while when I've been started to feel better, um, people at work say that I'm just it's like I'm a different person again. I'm I I just even the way I speak, the because I have more energy in my voice. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's not like, I mean, I, I I worked and got things done before, but it took so much effort that oh I'm God. not surprised yeah. that I seemed, you know, 
um, probably a bit irritable. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. When you're walking through your life exhausted, you don't have the energy to smile. And I know that makes some people go, well, that's ridiculous. But you, if you have not experienced that level of exhaustion, <laughs> yeah. you do not know how much no. energy it takes to smile and be sociable and be with around people and just, oh, yeah. I mean, just you know, yeah. travel through the world, even if you don't say anything. Yeah, it's an exhausting. It's an exhausting thing, and and my work, a lot of my work, was social, and right. and at one of the things I learned is we we tracked our activities for the day and assigned points to them depending on how exhausting that activity was and I wow. found so you know like two points for br brushing your teeth and 10 points for being in a conversation with more than one person right um and my day was spent talking to more than one oh person my so <laughs> it's like I'd have these insanely, uh, you know, I mean, it's not all, it's not always that way, but, but it was a good piece of my work right. was, was uh, being social. So, um, yeah, it's, yeah. it's uh, and so I had nothing, I, I feel like, I feel like I cheated my family for those two years right. if, um, because I had nothing left for them when I'd come home. I just, that's and, hard. And uh, yeah, I'm sure it was really hard for them. And I, 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 and uh, you, yeah, you lost them too, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And friends, you know, like I just, you know, I, you can tell people that you've got long COVID and that's why you can't do something. But at a, I was always terrified that people would stop contacting me mm -hmm. and that I would end up with no friends. And mm -hmm. luckily, you know, I I did have some friends that, um, you know, kept checking in with me, um, even if it was, you know, just like on Facebook Messenger or something. And how are you doing? And, mm -hmm. you know, and 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 also people you know, I encouraged people to keep inviting me to do things mm -hmm. that yes, I would say no, but please don't stop. Inviting yeah, because me. I might be able to one day, yeah. you know, after I've gotten all dressed to get there and go and yeah. I might still have energy to get there. Yeah. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times that I've actually gotten up wanting to go someplace and gotten ready and closed and makeup and all the jazz. And then I couldn't, I didn't have the energy to get out the door, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah, and a well, lot of people don't understand that's true. Yeah, we were both at that book launch event on yes. Wednesday night, and yeah. that's the first sort of big event I've been to. Um, wow! And I was so tired the next day. I, mm. I, uh, I, I could barely function the next right. day. So I, it, that makes me aware of the fact that I still. I still need to be really careful. Yeah. I'm really glad we went because it was great. But Oh, it was, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. No, I was really glad to be there. Next time, make sure you let people like me give you a ride home. Mm. I'd be happy to do that. Yeah. Thank you, Jane, for coming and chatting with us. This is really important information. And I, and I know lots of people have long COVID and everything, and I'm hoping that this helps people understand and give it a framework for what they're going through and know that it doesn't end here. You don't you know, things do get better. Life it, does come back to some form of normal. So it does. It does. And you develop your own, your own normal as well. So yes. Yeah. yeah. And change is good. Yes. Yes. It is. It is. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Jane. All right. You're listening to Rethreading Madness. I'm Bernadine Fox. And right now I'm speaking with Isabella Mori. Uh, extending the conversation a little bit more around COVID and particularly long COVID. Isabella, can you tell us a little bit about who you are? Yeah, hi, uh, um, I'm Isabella. I'm in my late 60s, live in Vancouver, and I'm a counselor and a writer. I'm nearing retirement. And I've had, uh, I contracted COVID in uh, early November last year. So I've been playing this long COVID game for about six, six months or so now. Six months. And can you tell us a little bit about what COVID was for you? Because I know people get different forms of it. What, what did yours look like? COVID itself was a breeze. 
Oh. It lasted, you know, for a few days. It was like a like a flu. Uh, um, uh, um, you know, I had some some you know brain fog and fever and I'm really tired. Uh, um, but it didn't didn't last very long. Uh, um, but then afterwards, I kept getting other infections, and uh, yeah, that's how it all started. When you say infections, what kind of infections? I had uh, two sinus infections. Oh, interesting. I've never heard of that before. Have you heard of that? Have other you've heard of other people having sinus infections? Um, yeah, I mean, it, there's, there's <laughs> no end to what people experience. Uh, um, one of the things that I experienced with the sinus infections was that my right ear was blocked for about two or three months, and that seems to be something quite common. Hmm. It's not interesting because I have not heard of that, although I've heard of a lot of people with sinus infections. So uh, maybe 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 people are having sinus infections and not realizing that it's a, an, a product of COVID. So when you say you had um, long COVID or you have long COVID, what does that mean? What does that look like? It means that I've just never really recuperated. Uh, um, I, uh, um, I mean, the, 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 you know, there was this week or so of, of of the actual COVID. And then I thought, oh, well, you know, I kind of like, it takes a little while to kind of like fully recuperate. And that's what my doctor said as well. But I never fully recuperated. Uh, um, uh, there's the worst part is that uh, um, I, I just feel weak all the time. Mm -hmm. I think when we talked before, you said weak and wobbly. Uh, yeah, my, my favorite description is woozy and wobbly. Woozy and wobbly. <laughs> woozy and, yeah. On the chronic fatigue side of things, I call that being wet spaghetti. I, yep. I, uh, and most people who have uh, profound fatigue, whether it's chronic fatigue or long COVID, understand it when I say wet spaghetti. It, uh, and woozy and wobbly is pretty good too. Um, so your fatigue, can you describe your fatigue? Well, really, fatigue is, is really not the right word. I mean, it's because with fatigue, uh, um, the implication is a certain amount of tiredness. I wish I was more tired more often than I could just kind of sleep the whole thing off or kind of, uh, but that rarely is the case. Uh, um, it's, um, but my, my muscles are fatigued. I especially notice it in, in my long muscles, my, my, uh, uh, legs and my back. Uh, um, they, they just, um, they just can't do a lot of work. Um, I recently realized that, for example, standing up and doing the dishes is one of my kryptonites. Hmm. How so? Well, uh, um, it's it's uh, I know I, I I do it and afterwards you know I I my back really aches uh, it might be it for me for the day uh, um, I have to I have to lie down uh, um, I have to at least sit down on a comfortable uh, um, surface for for a long time mm -hmm. that's that's another thing is that that uh, um, I love. I used to love sitting on hard back chairs. Like mm. uh, I can't do that anymore. I mean, it's I can do that for a short while, but but uh, um, yeah, that doesn't work for me anymore. It would seem that uh, if you're sitting on a hard back chair, you're not really resting your bones, is what I call it. Um, I I often call it. You know, I need to rest my bones, which means I need to be somewhere where I can just simply relax and and let whatever I'm sitting on sort of hold me up. And sometimes hardback chairs aren't the thing that can do that. Um, you exactly. mentioned, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, brain, you mentioned um, brain fog. Did you have any cognitive impairment? Um, I, I did and I do. Um, um, so the, the brain fog or, you know, whatever that means kind of uh, um, can mean that, that, especially doing sequential work, like, you know, for example, uh, um, trying to dig out two or three emails to get the information from there to, to then make a decision or, or a description or whatever, that just, you know, 
that often kind of freaks me out, like, please don't make me do that. <laughs> and I used to do that kind of thing all the time. Mm. Uh, um, uh, it also, like another cognitive impairment that I, I've noticed is that I, I used to be like an excellent time manager. I mean, it's it's, it's one of the things I was super proud of. Uh, um, and now it's like today, just today, I thought I had all my ducks in a row. And then last minute, I realized that I hadn't taken into, into my whole time management calculation that I had to go to the drugstore. Mm. And and that's just very unusual for me. It's it's. Uh, I mean, I might procrastinate because I decide to procrastinate, but that's very different from not kind of like, you know, having, as I said, like my time ducks in a row. Right. So how does that, I, I hate to do this because it's going to sound so sexist, but I certainly understand um, my issues around chronic fatigue. And I keep making that comparison because it's so obvious to me, but um, is that I found that um, one of the things that's happened to me since getting COVID is that I have a really hard time and I'm like super organizer here. I can organize massive, you know, very complex things in my head within, you know, a few minutes that takes most people, you know, reams of paper and thinking about it. Um, but cooking has been my downfall. I cannot organize a meal and have it cook in the right order so that it all sort of ends up on the table in the right place. Does that is that kind of what you're talking about in terms of time management? Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's, okay. for some reason, cooking is not a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but but yes, uh, um, because I think cooking is not a problem because it's more concrete. Uh, um, but again, like I I think of myself typically as a as a very accomplished abstract thinker, mm -hmm. and and that's again like I just I often say like I don't have the vision anymore. Oh, now that actually sounds scary to me. Um, when you say you don't have the vision, does that mean you're not able to visualize in your abstract thinking or, or, um, is you're Something not able like to put the abstract thinking together? Uh, um, or maybe another think, of those. <laughs> I think, I think both, uh, um, you know, I don't know if you ever watched The Good Doctor uh, uh, where, where Sean kind of mm. like, you know, has a medical problem and all of a sudden he visualizes all the right. organs and, and, and how it all fits together and everything. And, and I think I, I often think in the same manner right. and that is quite impaired now. What do you think caused that impairment? Okay, my, my immediate reaction to that is, is there's just too much short circuiting in my brain. Mm. When we talked before this interview, you mentioned your brain got hurt. And I'm not sure if you mentioned encephalitis or I did, but that word came up. Do you think that that's part of what's been happening for you? Yeah, I mean, it's encephalitis does not... Uh, um, I mean, yes, we talked about that. I'm, I'm not sure whether that really resonates, but but there is something it, it really, and sometimes it physically feels like there is something weird about my brain. I've, I've always been the kind of person who actually imagines that she can actually feel her brain. Wow, that's it fascinating. It feels weird. Does it does it work differently too? Like, does it work weirdly, or are there gaps? Or I don't mean that well, you're missing time, or you're not, you know, not mem remind remembering things. But um, it's it's kind of like uh, um, I mean, as you can see, like I think very much in metaphors. That's okay. Uh, um, uh, um, it's like there's some bricks falling out of the wall, hmm. <laughs> and then then you know my brain doesn't know what to do because all of a sudden there is a hole. Right. Interesting. One of the things that you mentioned was this weird emotional blip that happened for you and it had to do with your husband. Can you describe that for people? Yeah. So, so this was at the beginning. I, I suddenly, 
it's it's almost as if I kind of like for a while ended up in a different universe. And all of a sudden I was convinced that my marriage was on the fritz. Hmm. And and it's just like, you know, I've I've been very happily married for for over 25 years. And and it just but but it didn't really occur to me that that didn't make any sense. So it felt kind of very real at the time. Fallen into this, it's, it was a little bit like a like a form of paranoia almost. Mm-hmm. It's interesting because the person I talked to just before you um, kind of had the same kind of stuff happening, and and I think uh, on some oh. level it's a it's um, something that we don't really talk about. We talk about COVID as being headaches and sore throats and coughing and, you know, sort of physical ailments. And we talk, we, we know about um, loss of touch smells and um, uh, taste, but we also, I, I think that we're, we haven't been talking about, certainly I haven't been talking about, and I haven't been hearing about how, this thing can can hurt your brain and how in hurting your brain and certainly when you say loss of taste or smell that has to do with your brain she was talking about her heart rate going crazy and uh, not being able to regulate her temperature and all of those things happen in your brain as well and what you're talking about happens in your brain right i mean this can can if, if you were if you had a tumor in your brain this, you may ha- experience the same thing, some paranoia and thinking yeah. something is happening that's oh, not happening. Yeah. And yeah. so it's yeah. like it's hurt our brains on some level. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think I think uh, a lot of people see it as a, a neuro- neurological disorder. Hmm. COVID or long yeah. COVID. Long COVID, yeah. Uh, that's interesting because chronic fatigue is also considered a central nervous system yeah. disorder on lots of ways. So... So how has this affected you? Like you had, you had COVID, you got over COVID and then, and now you're dealing with this thing. How has it changed how you see yourself? Well, it hasn't changed how I see myself, but it has completely thrown a huge wrench into my life. Mm. Uh, uh, um, I mean, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of things I can't do. I mean, I can, even even talking for for longer than twenty minutes or so in a in a row. I mean, not in a conversation, but you know, I was was kind of reading something to myself out loud the other day. Uh, um, I you know that completely kind of screwed me up. So, so so well, it just like I'm I'm just completely exhausted, and my mm-hmm. my brain is like on fire. Wow, on fire, or or on on something. <laughs> does it hurt or does it feel like it's burning or I don't mean to get so particular, yeah, no, but no, that's no, a no, very no, no. interesting comment you made. I, th- I think on fire in the sense that, that, and it's kind of like more like a cold fire, but it's like, like all of a sudden, like, uh, um, y- you know, sometimes when you walk by, by uh, um, electrical lines over, mm-hmm. over land lines and they mm-hmm. kind of make this weird sound. Mm-hmm. It's it's like, yeah, everything is just sparking the wrong way. <laughs> I believe it was you that mentioned also that um, you you end up feeling sort of an electrical. That's probably not the right word for it. I I described it as being similar to when when I'm almost in a car accident and that fear response will send sort of that zip up the back of your yeah. neck and yeah. um, you know, and it, it's really anxiety. And then I just end up because of the chronic fatigue stuck in that. And you were mentioning kind of the same thing. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, um, and that was, uh, um, I had that like all day long the day be- that day or the day before we talked and it's yeah it's just kind of like this this buzzing it also kind of shows itself in tinnitus so mm-hmm. so it's like like everything is i guess not resting like my my nervous system or my brain or whatever the hell else is just kind of constantly buzzing that has to be exhausting 
Well, yeah, I mean, that's why I don't do very much. <laughs> <laughs> so all in all, COVID has, you know, came and went very mild, but you've been left with some very strange and very, in some ways, disabling consequences to it. I'm absolutely disabling, yes, yeah. yes. I mean, my, my daughter has, has chronic fatigue syndrome, and and she is she can do more than I can. Right. Right. And that may change over time, of course, yeah. as yeah. as your body heals. But but um, but in the meantime, you're left being a different person than you were before. Um, there is um, I know you just you said you were a counselor. There There is this thing that people keep saying that covid has caused a lot of mental health issues. And in your work, um, what are those mental health issues that that people are talking about? Um, it's it's it's. I have to say that that the biggest fallout that I have seen is is uh, was when when people were um, uh, you know when we weren't able to leave a lot, leave our house a lot. Mm-hmm. And people were were kind of basically stuck together, and you know frictions that that may have have already been there, really mounted. I mean, it's it's you know a lot of people have heard, for example, that that uh, domestic violence spiked oh, during those times. Yes, uh, um, I, I didn't see that, but 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 uh, um, but I saw yeah a lot of um, people who who whose relationships uh, um, became more difficult. Right. Do you feel that, that the kind of the stuff that we're talking about is also going to ultimately be another one of those things that, that we're left with in terms of mental health issues? I mean, you're having to kind of change how you see yourself in the world. Yes, I mean it's I'm 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 in a, a support group uh, um, with with other people, and uh, two support groups which are fabulous, and everybody should go to a support group who has long COVID mm-hmm. or anything like that. Uh, um, and and I see people who are uh, uh, left with really really deep depression right. and and anxiety. I I have dealt with depression and anxiety myself, and I'm so freaked out that that might happen uh, um you know that i might have another episode that i i am meticulous about my mental health hygiene and thank god that has worked so far but right. but uh, other people uh, um you know for whom you know for them it might not be enough or maybe they they don't have a lot of coping skills or whatever it's it's yeah right well thank you isabella for coming and mm-hmm. chatting with me I wish you luck. I wish you health. And um, we'll talk again soon, I'm sure. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure and a privilege to share my journey. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. You're listening to Rethreading Madness. I'm Bernadine Fox. And right now I have the pleasure of speaking with Fraser McKenzie from Coast Mental Health. Welcome, Fraser. Thank you. Nice to be here. I was hoping to have a conversation with you about um, the services and things that are available for folks through Coast Mental Health. Can you let us know what those things offer? Uh, Sure. Yeah. I mean, Coast Mental Health has been around since about 1972. It started off with some um, community housing. It was really linked in with the, um, uh, the consumer movement uh, of the early seventies that we associate uh, with the Mental Patients Association, um, some of those initial forays into uh, advocacy and autonomy around individuals with lived experience who were really trying to carve out a space for themselves. And uh, Coast recognized that from the outset and has grown exponentially since. Um, I, um, I am aware of a few things acutely, uh, namely the peer support program, which I manage with Coast, but I I also collaborate with a variety of others, including the outreach team, the uh, Coast Clubhouse, uh, the Young Adult Program, uh, and a few others that are a little bit further beyond my purview. Um, The Resource Center, out of which I'm based, is at uh, 1225 Seymour. 
It's about a, a 20 year old building. We had a, an initial um, sort of resource center on Richard Street earlier, but they built a dedicated building, a uh, two story building with a wonderful art room, a garden patio, a variety of offices, uh, an industrial kitchen um, about 25 years ago. And it's been running strongly ever since. Um, within the Coast Resource Center, we have the outreach team. Uh, we have mental health workers. We have a variety of psychosocial programming, the peer support program, uh, et cetera. Uh, the Coast Clubhouse is at 295 East 11th. Um, it's an older uh, established building just down from the Recovery Club. Um, it is a member run, and uh, it also houses uh, within the same geography, uh, the head office, um, our human resources department, our accounting department, et cetera. Uh, the clubhouse uh, welcomes people um, through their own programming. They have a transitional employment program. The young adult program is based there. And uh, yeah, there's uh, computers, there's a food program, there's housing resources. Um, but again, it, it really focuses on the the purview around the membership, around the leadership of the membership, around uh, the, the the lens of the lived experience piece and it is uh, intrinsically informed by that. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about the peer support initiative? Sure. Um, I joined Coast in 2011. Uh, the peer support initiative started a couple of years before that. So 2009, a gentleman named John Massam, in collaboration with my director, Tracy Rapanos, uh, established Coast Peer Support Program um, based along the guidelines of uh, you know, pre-existing psychosocial ambitions. Um, they created a curriculum, they trained peer support workers, uh, created a practicum format, and then also included them uh, into vocational ambitions. I stepped into John's role about 2013, 2014 as a program coordinator, and I've been at the helm ever since. And essentially, it's um, really honoring the wisdom and the strength of those of us with lived experience. I have my own lived experience uh, with mood disorder and um, uh, the substance delving. Mm -hmm. in a variety substance of delving. I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah for sure. I mean, they're often concurrent, right? We, we often right. try to manage our phenomena you know, through a variety of different mechanisms. Right. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it, it's the human experience, but it's the human experience uh, through the through the perspective of people who have to navigate systems that aren't necessarily friendly, that aren't necessarily welcoming, um, that can be violent, uh, that can be um, uh, stigmatizing, um, but using our experience navigating those bits and pieces and also our access to those systems, which can come from a violent perspective or a highly privileged perspective in order to help support other people that may be starting that journey. Right. Um, so, I mean, recovery is a bit of a loaded term and we're all on kind of different journeys. Peer support really is trying to utilize our lived experience as something unique um, and wisdom filled. So you're basically training peer support workers from folks who have lived experience. How many people go through the program a year? I would, well, a cohort is typically a dozen folks. Um, oh, okay. So we, cool. we have a couple of different groups. We have a young adult initiative, which would be, say, 19 to 30 years old. And then mm -hmm. we have a, the conventional training, which would be maybe late 20s upwards. Right. Um, and they're kind of tailored uni uniquely. Um, and we try to do three cohorts a year. Um, the classroom portion is about two and a half or three months, uh, you know, three hours a day, three days a week. And then we uh, add in a practicum component, which is about 30 or 40 hours or, or, or three months following that. And if that's done successfully and the competencies are, are being exercised and oxygenated in a meaningful way, then uh, we certify people uh, in a positive way. And then, uh, it, you know, head them out into uh, vocational and job placements, usually six month job placements. Wow, that's wonderful. Um, tell me about the clubhouse. You said it's member run um can anybody walk in the front door or do they need to be referred 
I, I, I'm not an expert on the clubhouse. I would okay. recommend chatting with Simone Frey, who is the manager there. My so, understanding of any clubhouse model, and, and Coast is certainly um, a part of that, is that it is uh, intrinsically member-run. So you're really leaning upon the expertise uh, and the needs and uh, the resources that are defined by the membership. So right. it has to be a, a, a collaborative and self-defining sort of a thing. That's cool. And the resource center, I, what I know about the resource center is that I do know Leaf Evans, mm -hmm. who does paint in the art studio and has for quite some time. So I, I've been there, I've been up to the art studio, I've kind of seen the lay of the land. He's told me that it's changed, it's made bigger, they've taken down a wall or something. But but when I went through, there were, there were a lot of people there. Some were hanging out, some were in the art studio, some were doing other things. What kinds of things can people come and can they walk in the front door? Or do they need to be referred? Does it need to be arranged ahead of time? Anybody can walk in. I, okay. I think uh, I, ideally over time we get to know people, we develop relationships and we encourage people to become members mm -hmm. um, so that we can work with them a little bit more intimately. We can get to know them. It is all relational work. So in order to uh, substantiate and, and create that connection, um, some consistency is usually beneficial. Um, and then we can kind of help uh, navigate goals and support people uh, in a meaningful way. Right. Uh, so membership is encouraged. Membership isn't uh, contingent upon a diagnosis. It really is about identifying people who could benefit from a space uh, that offers access to food, that act, uh, offers access to shelter, that offers access to uh, mental health workers who are well-versed in um, aligning people with uh, supports and resources whether it be housing or income assistance or anything else. Um, but also within uh, the framework of the Resource Center, there are some really, really cool programs that engage people. And um, they're often peer-led, uh, and they often reflect the interests um, and the passions of the people that are attending. So right. it may be a gardening group. It may be a, a group that involves polymer clay or pottery or drawing, there could be a music appreciation piece, there could be karaoke, um, there could be a fems and thems group, like a non-binary group. Uh, what we really encourage the peers to do is to bring their interests to the table, uh, their own aptitudes, and then to propose ideas that could be well reflected uh, and, and uh, you know, that, that will align with the interests of the people that are attending. That sounds marvelous, actually. I um... It, it is something that's very needed. Tell me what Coast Mental Health is there for, because these are just a few of the programs of Coast Mental Health. That's right. I mean, I think... If we want to look at it from an overall perspective, I know there are some things that you mentioned that are self-referral, like um, the clubhouse and the resource center, but there is another part of Coast Mental Health that that um, does a, a wider range of things. And I'm hoping that we can just touch on that a little bit, even though people can't self-refer to it. Yeah, I mean, Coast Mental Health has, has a variety of, uh, of facets to it. There are um, the rehab and recovery program that's out at, uh, at Riverview. There's a, there's a forensic program. There's a, there's young adult programs and housing programs and modular housing programs in Maple Ridge. Um, we started very, very small and have grown, well, particularly the last three years, we've almost doubled in size. Um, the housing piece, I think, was uh, the initial foray, and that's something that we've been focusing on uh, longitudinally and has been very, very successful. You know, Coast, ultimately for me, uh, has represented a nonprofit organization that has truly taken the ground up uh, philosophy to heart, um, which you know was was a part of a number of movements in the late sixties and early seventies. Right. Yes, um, but but that that thread that pulse maintains, and I think that that spirit uh, is part of the reason why perhaps our peer support program uh, has maintained. Yeah, I, I talk to a lot of people. And of course, one of the things that they say over and over and over is that the peer support, the the one on one chatting with other people who have the same kind of lived experience as they do is one of the most profound things that they have experienced. And then the, one of the most uh, healing things, I mean, don't want to underestimate the importance of um, therapy or, you know, any of those things, but I just want to put my own little um, support in there for peer support. It is a very valuable, very profound and powerful 
tool in the healing process. Yes. Yeah. No, I, I agree. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You also do some street outreach and I know we're nearing the end of our time here, but I did want to ask you about that. You, you do work with unhoused people. That's correct. We work out of the downtown South. Uh, mm -hmm. The resort center is based there. That's where the outreach team is. Um, that is um, a service that anybody can access from um, any and any origin points. So you can literally walk in off the street and access the outreach department. You do not need to be a member. You do not need to be known to us. You can simply attend the resource center, speak with an outreach worker, um, and investigate and pursue things like income assistance, OAS, um, uh, PWD, rental supplements, crisis grants, uh, housing initiatives, whether it be supportive or semi-supportive or independent or market. Um, there's uh, the shelter aid for elderly residents. We help with ID. We help with community resources, clothing-wise and food-wise. Um, they're an exceptional team. There's generally five people that are involved. Um, and that's been uh, something that we've been doing effectively with BC Housing uh, since since the, uh, the, the ictus uh, of the Resource Center. Wow, that's wonderful. Fraser, thank you so much for coming and chatting with me about this very important organization and the work that they do. Clearly would um, suggest to anybody who is living with a mental health challenge to check out their resources and what they have to offer. Um, Fraser, you had um, an email address that somebody could reach you at. Sure. Peer support at coastmentalhealth.com. Uh, will will reach me uh, immediately. And if you're interested in outreach services, then I would recommend emailing outreach resource center at coastmentalhealth.com. Okay, I'm going to say those again. So outreach resource center at coastmentalhealth, all one word, dot com, and peer support at coastmentalhealth, all one word again, dot com. Did I get that right? That's it. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Fraser. And uh, thanks very much, Bernadine. Yeah, you're welcome. My thanks to Jane Bowie and Isabella Mori for coming and chatting with me about long COVID and how it's impacted on their mental and physical health. I found both of those conversations to be similar, but equally informative and helpful. And to Fraser McKenzie for chatting with me about the services people can access at Coast Mental Health. Thank you for taking the time to be here. Our music is by Sherry Ulrich, who sings us in and out of our shows each week. And most importantly, my thanks goes out to you for joining us today. Stay safe out there. I'm Bernadine Fox, and you've just listened to Rethreading Madness, the podcast that dares to change how we think about mental health. We air live on Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM, every Tuesday at 5 p.m. or online at coopradio.org. If you have questions or feedback about this program or want to share your story or have something to say to us, we want to hear from you. You can reach us by email, rethreadingmadness at coopradio.org. If you enjoyed this show, subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. Surely you don't have
cliche Just words people say to be nice Somehow 